point. We're going to, uh, uh, first of all, let me just say a, a disclaimer that almost everything that I talked about this morning was pertained to women as well as the men. So, uh, for those of you who work with women uh, in choirs, uh, it will pretty much be uh, applicable to those uh, singers as well. So, I'd like you to fill in the blank. I'd like the men in the choir, it doesn't have to be a, a TTVB choir, but I'd like the men in the choir to sound. Fill in the blank. Okay. I'd like them to sound. Beautiful. <laughs> I'd like them to sound beautiful, absolutely. Yes, what else? I'd like them to sound rich. I'd like them to be rich, but I'd like them to sound rich as well. <laughs> I'd like them to sound rich. What do you mean by rich? Um, deep, bold, masculine. Okay. Okay. In what way? Maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's sometimes brilliant and sometimes uh, gentle. Maybe that's sometimes dark, sometimes absolutely uh, fearsome. All of the possibilities. Character, absolutely. Okay, what else? In, in what way? She said sensitive, sensitive to what's around me. That has, that has to do with balance as well as uh, a dynamic level. So that it is, uh, uh, I love, uh, as probably most of us do, I love the basis to be full and, and for us to have something in which to build. And, and you're talking a little bit about that as well. I'd like the sound to be thrilling as well, and massive and intimate and gentle. All of the possibilities there. I'd like it to be a warm. I'd like the sound to be sweet if it needs to be. All of this, by the way, is determined by the music we're working on. And the same is true for women. I'd like it for, for me from pianissimo to fortissimo, and not from mezzo forte to forte. I'd like the dynamic palette to be as wide as, as, as 
three years, as the music requires. Everyone, could, and, and this is, I think, pretty important to remember, everyone can sing loudly. Every male chorus I know, or every men's session that I know can sing loudly, if, if we expect it. But not every one of them sings strongly and beautifully. And that I really I would really love for that. As the sound becomes fuller, I'd love for it to become richer and sweeter and warmer as well. Um, I'd love the pianist most to be breath filled and energized and spacious and beautiful. I'd love the, the scene to be rhythmically infused so that there's a, a real core of inner pulse. All of these things, I'd, I'd say the same thing about women as well. I'd love, uh, and, and for that to happen, particularly with men, I think it's crucial that we learn music softly. And then we add energy and intensity as the sound, as the music becomes better learned. <clears throat> I used to, uh, uh, when I used to conduct the Michigan Men's Glee Club, um, I conducted them from oh, 14 years to 88 to 2003. And um, if the football game was at Ohio State, the Michigan Glee Club would go to Ohio State, and, and we would share concert with the OSU Glee Club. And if the football game was in Ann Arbor, the OSU Glee Club would come up to Ann Arbor, so we did that for several years, actually, been years. And Jim Gallagher, who is a dear friend, was a conductor at OSU, and, uh, and the OSU men always sang in tune. They sang so beautifully in tune. Uh, the, the, there's an interesting story about that. Prior to my time at Michigan, uh, OSU came up to Ann Arbor and did a concert, and Jim was new with the OSU Glee Club. The OSU Glee Club had been in a, a bit of a slump, and they sang a concert, and they shared a concert with Michigan Glee Club. Michigan Glee Club sounded really good that time, before I started. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that went downhill soon as I said. And um, <clears throat> they went home and said, that will never happen again. We will not let that happen again. And that was the bar that became for them the impetus to, to really improve their game. It was very smart on his part. I mean, he would have known that that was the case, that they did something that Michigan sounded really good. So that just turned it around. Uh, Men love competition. We thrive on that possibility of, of improving and seeing and hearing something that's better and saying, okay, we can do that. We work hard if we have it. Anyway, so I went to Jim one day and, and we're good friends and, and I said, Jim, why do your fellows always sing so beautifully in tune? That it's just, they, that always the sound is sweet and beautifully in tune. And he said, well, I, I really believe in learning music so often. If we start by learning softly with great posture and great breath and great energy and, and, and focus and all of those things, then we can sing strongly and it will still be tune. But if we start mezzo forte or forte, just a generic sound, and we learn the music that way, we don't hear if those sounds are tune. We don't hear if the passaggio is being lifted over sweetly. We just, people don't listen in, in that way, in a critical <clears throat> and self improving way was a life change for me, uh, and uh, it's always, uh, men don't say, default is not men singing in tune. Default is men singing out of tune. And we have to improve that default, we have to take it off, uh, we have to choose the font that we want, and the font is in tune at every moment. Um, I'd like the sound to be intimate if it's supposed to, if that's what the music calls for, I'd like to be energized if that's what the music calls for, and I think that the men's sound always can be energized. Um, I'd like it to not be fuzzy or brash. Uh, I don't think, um, I don't think, uh, how can I say this gently? It won't sound gently. Uh, I don't think church choir sopranos over 80 have a pointer on ugliness. I think men have a pointer on ugliness too. I think we can sound as as unbeautiful as anyone. So, so I don't think anybody um, deserves our wrath any more than anybody else. Um, I'm not such a fan of, of the fuzziness that creeps into all of our voices as we get older. And it's really true with men. And um, so I think uh, there are ways to combat that, and there are ways to, to energize that, to help with that. Um, but life does take a bit of a toll. Um, I, as I mentioned yesterday, there is nothing normal about great choral singing. There is nothing normal about a, a beautiful sound. And it is because we have engendered the possibility of hearing and 
and produce it that can make it um, better than normal. And I also think that the passaggio is a real issue for men in singing, maybe a little more than women, although my experience has been that women who carry chest voice up too high, then that becomes the, the issue with women. But for men, it tends to be, how do I handle that, that uh, I've never used the word break, but that area where it feels unsteady and um, where I'm either going to be in falsetto, am I going to be in chest voice, am I going to be a mixture of those two? Uh, I remember a few years ago, when I was leading the, the high school choir, in the summertime of Michigan, and in our high school choir camp, and there were those young fellows in the choir who, whose voice was probably changing even as we spoke. And so, he would, you know, uh, and I always vocalized in falsetto, and we were going down, and then I'm really interested in, in easing and letting the falsetto color the middle voice. And so, his, his falsetto was, and just absolutely went, well, there's something in the middle there, fellow. Let's see if we can find that. And he could sing up to the top of his chest voice just fine. And it's having truly horrible by the time you get to the top of his chest voice. But by, after a week, he figured it out. We had been able to mix those two. But it's a pretty advanced concept, and we'll work a little bit on that. So we're going to work, uh, we're going to do some warm ups first. Uh, as I said yesterday, I, I hate warm ups, but it's an opportunity for us to fix a few things that maybe we'll carry over into the rehearsal. Uh, in the warm-ups, we do have a possibility of developing sound. We do have a possibility of instilling good breath habits. Uh, we do have a possibility of developing some articulation possibilities and some diction possibilities and vowel color possibilities that, that are different from the way we normally live. We do have the possibility for, to develop some reading skills and, and even we can be creative uh, in the warm-up about how we might want to do that. We certainly can develop uh, energy and, and rehearsal focus. We certainly can develop in a a sense of, of how to follow a conductor, what the conductor is really saying gesturally, and what the conductor imagines to be the beautiful, uh, what the conductor imagines to be beautiful. Let's just stop there. Because if in that first few minutes of a rehearsal, we have to leave the real world behind, and we have to get into the world of beauty. The world of beauty is determined by the conductor. What does the conductor imagine in terms of sound and articulation and communication? And that's not the real world. We don't live in that world. We don't have that possibility the first time. <clears throat> and it's also a great opportunity for us to teach vocal technique uh, that, that, uh, that in particular, if, if our people might not all take voice lessons. So, we do a little warm up. Some of these things we have, I've done with, with others in the rehearsal the other night, some will be specifically. Uh, focus for men. I would, I would encourage you, uh, uh, the video that I did for Santa Barbara Music several years ago has a lot of these sort of things on it, so if you're making notes or whatever you say, I don't have a list, but that's, most of those are on that video, you can see that if you'd like. That's called Working with Male Voices. Uh, I'm sorry? Working with Male Voices, and it's on that bibliography that I passed up for today, if you have a copy of that bibliography. And if not, I'm sure there's some extra copies of that floating in that someplace. And published by Santa Barbara. There's also online. Oh, well, good for them. <laughs> It'll pay for my cup of coffee this morning. That's fantastic. <laughs> oh, maybe not. That would be expensive. <laughs> one doesn't make money on that. Okay, great, great, great. So um, I put the gentleman back here so that women, you can just hear what we're going to do. And, and so, gentlemen, would you stand there? Maybe you can Great, great. And Baritons, where are you? Fantastic. Yeah, what? Okay. I'm mean, not going to say that because there are always more baritones than anybody else, right? There are always more baritones. And basses? Bass twos? Bass two? Good. But I almost love you the most. I almost love you the most. I probably love the first tenor the most because there's no one here to call the first tenor. But, <laughs> so, but, I, but second basses are worth every bit of, of their weight in gold because if this is a great part, it's because the basses are great. If this is horrible part, it's because the basses are horrible. If we're in tune, it's because of the basses. If we're out of tune, if we're out of tune, it's because of the basses. If we have a beautiful sound, it's because of the basses. If we're dragging, it's because of the basses. If we're rushing, it's because of the basses. Everything is the basses problem. And, and, if, if it is fantastic, it is all because of the basses. Alright, so it's all because of the basses. 
Now, the other side of that is that if people aren't listening to the basses, then we have the possibilities of talent messing up. Or if the altos are not listening to the basses, we have the possibility of that messing up. The same is true if you stand in front of an orchestra. If the orchestra is rushing, it's the basses and the cellos fall. If the orchestra is dragging, it's the basses and cellos fall. And if it's and if it's somebody else in the orchestra, it's because they're not listening to the lowest sound. The lowest sound determines everything. If it's an SSA group, it's the A's. If it's an SAT group, it's the B's. If it's an SAT group, it's the T's. It's the lowest sounding pitch that determines everything. Tempo, dynamic, articulation, color. Everything is determined by the basis. So they don't feel no pressure basis, but if, but don't mess up. Great, 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 great. Great, turn your right massage the controllers, make sure you know their name. Dig in. Dig in. Dig in. We call this bonding. Because, because whether they know it or not, men like to touch each other. <laughs> there is a reason. There is a reason why fellas in high school who walk down the hall don't just walk by themselves while they run into each other and elbow each other and push each other into the wall. There's a reason for that. And it's because they want to play. And they want buttons. And they want to play. Okay, turn and recap about the person who was just touching. As, as Tim Allen said to me yesterday, as Tim Allen said to me yesterday, uh, he said, fellas are packed down last week. They want to lead or they want to follow somebody. Absolutely. And, and if, uh, without being uh, uh, sexist, I, I think that's not quite so true of women. I think women are more interested in, in how do I fit into this situation and, and what, what are others thinking of me and, and how, what is my place in this, in this hierarchy and what can I do? And men and tend to be, I, I want to follow strongly. No, I also say, I also say, hey, you can stop now. Right? <laughs> Please don't stop. Stay up, do not sit down. But there was, all, there was also a, a real reason why football coaches don't say, don't say, could you just run a little faster? If you, and the next time, don't drop. Just kind of, just hang on to a little longer and then just sort of run the other direction. Football says, come on, you need to no, 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 no. And respond to that. If I do that with a women's group, a women's group thinks I don't want them. Thinks I'm yelling at them. I'm angry at them. And men tend to think, okay, yeah, he's right. I need to do that. And tend to rise to that occasion. There's just a little different mentality that happens. And one is not that thing, I believe. It's just a little different. And, and we can uh, finesse that to the advantage of the music, let's say that, and make that work to our advantage. And you're, that was very good, and you, you all know each other's names, that's really great. Join me, we did a little, little bit yesterday, join me, join me, find me, find my hands, good, right, right. Okay. So many messes up, I usually say it's a freshman. Yeah. <laughs> 
big motion, big sound. Um, Feel it if you'd like to. Good. But if it needs more, uh, the sound is a little too, I don't know, whatever. 
Or, then that's a good one for that. Boy, 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 they come. Snossy snoo! Snossy snoo! Vertical or horizontal? That's a question fantastic. You may use words. That's cool. Yeah, vertical or horizontal? Perfect. Perfect. North, south, or east, west? North, south. Good longitude or latitude? Oval or square? I have no idea. That's just a little bit of a joke.
just happens. It just does. If we're in falsetto, and we're back, we sang up to a high E, that's 10 notes above middle C. And without anybody thinking that's a little high, because it just it just happens. And and a juggling, a, a sometimes uh, if you juggle feathers, it will either be even be. I love that sound because suddenly we realize, not suddenly, but we realize that it doesn't happen. But loud doesn't feel harder. Low doesn't feel easier. High is high, low is low, high is beautiful, low is beautiful. All of those things make sense together. <coughs> Demonstrate the best plans to you just now. 
but uh, warm-ups longer than five to seven minutes become an end in themselves and not, I think, at least for me personally, and not an, a, a procedure to what's going to happen afterwards. Some people, uh, sound, the sound in the warm-ups are so absolutely gorgeous and magnificent and it has no effect whatsoever on the music that comes up, but I'm always amazed at that. Okay, let's sing some Bach, and let's do the English for now, all right?
right? What that does, and, and in this case it's a little high when it gets to the high end, <laughs> but what that does is when we go back and put it in our regular voice, it is the sweetest, most beautifully floated because it feels so comfortable because we have created all of that space that happens with the false pedal. I absolutely do the same thing with women. If you have a women's line that, that is sort of D to F sharp, we take it for some rounds, to G, that, that D to F sharp, where passaggio land, where it gets a little out of tune, there's too much weight on it, I'm saying F and off here. Some won't be able to do it because that's high C, high D, high E, high F sharp. But they will certainly create all that space and they go back to where it is and it is cake. And it is sweet and lifted and elegant and it really, really helps improve diction. Uh, it really helps improve intonation. Well, um, uh, Lynn, would you come up a minute? This is not your worst nightmare coming true. <laughs> you can put your music down. Okay. Uh, grab me in this rubber band. Okay. Don't let go. Because it really hurts. Yeah, um, crescendo or diminuendo? That's a question. Okay, yeah. Crescendo or diminuendo? Diminuendo, absolutely. Uh, intent, uh, energy or relaxation? Both. Yeah, yeah. Re uh, relaxation. Right. Okay. Would you sing from it again? Two. This is right where we come in. Two and and everybody on the tenor line again. Two and three and one. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's 
There are about 16 different yay vowels. Yay! Yay! Why the H? Yay! Yay! It's a closed mouth sound. Eh? It's a closed mouth sound. If it opens up, what does it become? An ah. Eh? Just by opening my mouth, it becomes an ah. So if we sing an E H vowel, then we just don't, we just keep our mouths relatively small. And that's people like, yay! Yeah.
Or if you have older singers that you'd like to have sound younger, maybe you have younger singers come in and just demonstrate and say, let's match that. Um, young singers, uh, and it's true with any male singers, and it's true with women singers as well, will rise to the level of the expectations of the conductor. So, bring the bar. Bring the bar. Raise the bar. That's what happened with the OSU Fleet Club in the Michigan. And Jim, in his very kind and, and elegant manner, would say that to me over and over. Almost every time we would get our groups together, he said, you know, the reason that we sound, that we are similar in, in excellence is because we came up to Michigan one time. And, and, and which is really great. Singers want camaraderie. Camaraderie. Oh, hell no. <laughs> I'm a fun boy. He says, yeah. Men, men want camaraderie. They want brothers and they want buddies. And that tends to be, a, a, in addition to, particularly in church situation, situation where they want the opportunity to minister with gifts that, have, that they have been given. But they want to do it also with people that they feel comfortable with and that they can, uh, particularly in the school or in the university, they can hang out with. That they, that they really want to, um, to make really great friends. Um, they want, men want a goal. They want something to point to. Um, this is a little tangential, but uh, and I, I should have said it in the rehearsal thing. You can never, in, in conducting, you can never know what's going on in somebody's head. By how they look inside. Never. It's absolutely true in conducting an orchestra. They can look the grumpiest that you could possibly imagine. It could just be the way they hold the fire. You know? They could have had a bad lunch. You know nothing about what's going on in their head. I will never forget it. It's a lesson that I have that I carry with me always. My very first year at Michigan, the, uh, there was a, a young man who joined the Michigan Men's League Club, and he was a third year law school student, very smart young man, sharp looking fellow. Uh, very smart, and he hadn't been in the choir in any of his years at the university, and he said, I just wanted to do it my last year. He had a good voice, so uh, we uh, accepted him in the Glee Club, and, and he wasn't paying the entire year. Yeah, we, we did a four-week tour of Asia that year, which was not every day. It was fantastic. I loved every minute of it, except it was too many minutes of it. Four weeks is just too long. Uh, anyway, at that point, this was 1989, we, we wanted a burger <laughs> by the end of the trip. Uh, at any rate, uh, he was the fellow who would say, I don't want to do the city tour. He would be the fellow that would show up late every morning. He would be the fellow that just would always take a little different. And I just wrote him off. I thought, I don't, I don't want to deal with him. He's going to graduate. He's gone. And I just said goodbye with relish. And about three or four years after that, he developed uh, a disease and died. And he uh, left money in his will to the University of Michigan and Sleep Club. And he said in his will, this is the best year of my life. Never would have done that. Never would have done it. Never would have done it from looking at it. Never would have done it from talking to him. And, and he said, I, in his will, he said, I want this money to be used for times of camaraderie, for, particularly for fellows who don't have the money to do that. Because they tend to, they always have to run the rehearsals go out to a piece of place. And he said, I want that to be used for those times. Well, that was very sweet. And so we sang for his memorial service, and his parents gave me his tour bag. You know, the overseas tour, we tend to get you know, a bag of heavy monitor, whatever, where you're going. And they gave me his bag, and I stuck it on the top of my bookshelf in my office, just to remind me, to remind me that you can never tell what someone's thinking. What's going on inside is completely different often than what's going on the outside. It's true of men, it's true of women, it's true of an orchestra, it's true. We have to make the music and let it come home. And then let that, <clears throat> the words that we're living with, the, the way we interact with them, let them take whatever route they have. Sometimes it's just people need to grow up a little bit. And time will help with that. So you never know what's really going on the inside. Um, male singers want a strong and dependable leader. I, with a couple of, uh, at least one of the very best male courses, well, a couple of the very best male courses in America right now are conducted by women. It doesn't have to be male, female conducting men's courts. Sometimes I get that question, you know, woman conduct a men's court? Absolutely. Um, and uh, the conductor of the uh, BYU Brigham Young University men's course, which is about 220 
his fingers, um, is a very brilliant British woman. Fantastic. It's uh, fantastic. University of Wyoming, of course, a uh, wonderful uh, conductor. So it, it, the, the leader needs to be the person with the vision that says, this is the way it's going to be. Join me. And I'd like to take leadership as well. I know with the mission of the Club, it's very, those officers take a huge role in leading and making that happen. And, and fellows will rise to that occasion as well. Um, the sometimes I'm also asked, can, can women demonstrate, you do a lot of things in full cell, can women do that sort of thing as men's can? And I always say, and ladies, you can do this for us. Ladies, what you're saying good morning is if you were being a good morning. Good morning. Thank you. And, and, and as if you parked your 16 wheeler just outside. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so we absolutely you can do that just as well as any man can. You can say, like, good morning! You can tell them you're morning! You say, hi, mm, holy moly, holy moly. And you can answer all of those sort of things. Now we have about 30 seconds if anybody has probing questions. Thank you, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have anything that they'd like to? Yep. Yeah. I want people to listen. I want them to, yeah, I want them to, first of all, I want them to follow. And second of all, I want them to have to adjust the way they're thinking so I don't want them to get set at any pattern. I don't want them to think, oh, I didn't click out. I one time, when my children, when my daughter was about first grade, second grade, I, and we were living in Southern California at the time, and I walked by the outside of her music room. And you know, in California, everything's outside, so that the old windows were open, and we were walking, I was walking by. And I heard the teacher warning them up, and the teacher was taking attendance as she was warning them up. And she was maybe just going up my half step, and it was... But by the time I walked by, it was... And nobody was on pitch. She wasn't hearing a single note. And it was just because by that time in the attendance book, that's where she'd gotten. Okay. So, skip around. Make them adjust. Now, you can be crafty. Your mother is crafty. Yep. You said something yesterday about um, men's false service as men age. And sometimes, sometimes, I know myself as I age, Sometimes false error becomes a little less reliable, sometimes a little less pliable. But probably it's because we don't speak in that voice as much anymore. And, and I, I really encourage, I conduct the, the, the Pro Union, which has fellows from age 22 to 80 in, in the Coral Union. And I don't know actually that we have anybody from 80 anymore. Um, but, but we do things in false error. And I always say, if that's not uncomfortable, if you don't have it anymore, just join us when you stop and you're not going to lose. And there will always be people for whom, ooh, I can go on, that's fantastic. Because it, that tends to rest the voice. It's true for women as well. I conducted the Berkshire Choral Festival last week, and um, I, um, there were several singers, a lot of singers, who were aging. Uh, wonderful singers with such focus and, and how many years of experience in that choir, 120. Wow. Uh, but but we did a lot in this voice, and most of them had not. And by the end of the week, people were saying, "My voice feels stronger. It feels more reliable than it did at the beginning of the week." I, I often would, you know, after a week of singing like this, would be exhausted. My voice gets more numb than it had at the beginning of the week. It, it feels rested. Using full sound tends to rest the voice because it's it's singing in a different way. It's the best way I know of of working in foreign language. Dear Hesse, no boy. Dear Hesse. Dear Hesse. See, those vowels are not matched anymore. They were matched when we used this voice. And that, this voice is as close to singing as we can get without actually singing. I used to get so frustrated before I started doing this. I used to get so frustrated because we'd speak the text and it would, get, it would be exactly the way it was. And then we'd start singing it. And it was back to those other sounds that I didn't want. And speak it and we get back. But those are two different voices. Speaking and the voice living in a line of speech, living in a line of music are two different worlds. So using this voice, we're already in a line of music. We just don't know it. Any other questions? Um, I think part of that has to do with the range that uh, women are singing in. 
if they did, particularly for sopranos, because that's, it sometimes is a little high. And so I often will have, say to women, uh, would you consider singing alto? For whom that is just the highest is hard, so they have to you know, squeeze, or they have to add more of a bra or whatever they would like. And sometimes those upper notes are just not going because of, of the suppleness of breath supply and all those sort of things. Men, we still probably have that voice that we can access, access sometimes, but sometimes we do sound fuzzy and, and unfocused, and, and it has to do with breath, it has to do with suppleness of vocal. Uh, I don't know that any of us uh, will escape the ravages of age and our singing. Um, you know, uh, I, I have a dream of walking in dreams, and uh, bucket list is pretty long, but one of the dreams that I have is to start a singing choir in uh, the choir for seniors. We don't have a good one now. We don't really have any at this point, and, and our has been listed as one of the best places in America to retire because there are so many things to do. I mean, you have the university, tons of free concerts and, and parties and all this sort of thing, that's, and shopping and restaurants and so on, that, that is really great for those who want to retire. So, I'd like to start a senior choir. I was talking to Sandra Willits not too long ago. Sandra Willits used to be at the University of Alabama. And Sandra's a wonderful conductor. And Sandra moved to uh, the villages in Florida when she retired. If you live in the villages, you drive a golf cart and play a lot of golf. You know, and, car, and cars are sort of not much used. And so I was doing something in Florida. I was talking a mile a minute like I usually do. And Sandra came up to me and heard this southern uh, and She said, Jerry. She said, I conduct a choir of seniors, and we have 140 people in my choir. And she said, we rehearse on Tuesday mornings from 10 to 11.30. She said, Jerry, if I talk this fast, she and you may say, what bar are you on? <laughs> she said, but my issues are not notes and rules. My issues are, my husband died yesterday, and I was diagnosed with cancer last week. And she said, that's why we sing. Well, that was really good. Really good uh, encouragement to them to look at the big picture and say, okay, we need to be one of those. We need to have one of those now. And partly it was because that in the core union that I conduct, there are just times when we have to say, we, we audition every two years, but sometimes we just have to say, there's not a place for you anymore unless you're willing to sing out well. Because competition in for particular, even as a soprano or whatever, is, is a little stronger. I'd love for a place, I'd love for there to be a place for them. For those folks that might not fit into that ensemble anymore, to have a, a wonderful opportunity to sit and keep singing. Because it's family. We sing because we want a family. We want friends. We want, we want to say something. Okay, now I know I've kept you over. I have another session in about eight minutes or whatever. So, so thank you. Thank you for being brave, man.